Good evening, everyone. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is for us to share together on this Lord's Day. I pray the blessings of the Lord are with you as we're sharing together. We do apologize for the lateness of our starting tonight. Um, just had a few technical difficulties, but we pray that you're joining us and we thank God for each of you. Um, sometimes we have things that happen in technology that we have no control over, but I'm certainly grateful tonight for the opportunity that the Lord has given us to share together. He's a great God, worthy of all praise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to come to your word. We pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, and direct us in all that we say and do. We thank you, O oh God, for our brothers and sisters who are gathering together to share in your word. Allow your word to minister to us and bring life, strength, and healing. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Certainly, again, I bless God for you. I apologize for, for the quality tonight of our picture. Um, but again, we are thankful for the opportunity to share with you tonight. Um, we bless God for you, Kingdom Life, the future ministry family. We thank God for all of you who are joining in tonight with us. Um, we thank God for um, the uh, Kingdom Life Cathedral Ministry citizens, as I said, and your families. We thank God for the King's Apostle Church International family and the Kingdom Life Global Fellowship family. All of you, we bless God for you. We are continuing in our series, Wisdom for Living in the Book of Proverbs. Second Peter chapter one, verse three is one of my favorite scriptures. It says these words, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. I understand that there are some things about us you and I, that God continues to perfect as we yield to him and say yes to him. There are things that he continues to deliver us from as we yield to him, whether it's fear or something, jealousy, worry, pride, or anger. God's word has not lost its power to address those needs. God's word has not lost its power since the beginning of time. The same power that transformed planet Earth from that which was void, dark, and without form, and in a, and in a fluid condition to that which was teeming with life, clothed in beauty, and reflection of the image of God is available today to change and fill empty lives. I'm grateful for that. There is no life so shattered and devastating that it is beyond God's power to redeem and transform. The process of transformation that invariably takes place through the preparation of the spirit and the daily application of his word is illustrated by what took place in the beginning of planet Earth. God spoke his word and change happened. God's power changed the earth in the beginning and his power is available to change you and I today. As we totally yield our lives to the control of God's spirit within us, he uses the responsibilities, the relationships, and the ridicule. He uses the opportunities, the obstacles, and the obligations. He uses the pressure and the pain and the problems. He uses the success, sickness, and solitude. He uses all things to work for our ultimate good, which is increasing progressive uh, causing you and I to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. 
This is why we have the testimony that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Oh, what a treasure you and I are. We are God's treasure in the earth. When God looked throughout the universe for something to give his only son in reward for what he had accomplished on the earth, the Father handpicked you. You are the Father's treasure, his priceless gift of love to the Son. Psalms 90, verse 12, is another one of my favorite verses, especially during this time of study in, in the book of Proverbs. It says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The original King James text says that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Tonight, in, as we begin Proverbs chapter 21, and we'll see how far we can get tonight, we're going to talk about wisdom for the heart. Wisdom for the heart. I'm so grateful for, for, for Elder uh, Ralph Wisdom, our director of media, who does a tremendous job in helping me and helping me look good. I appreciate him and his gift. Let's look at verse number one of Proverbs chapter 21. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the river of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Here Solomon teaches us two things. Number one, that every one of us should routinely take a self inventory. And number two, that even when we do perform self examinations, it can be deceitful because we sometimes subconsciously convince ourselves that we are right even when we are dead wrong. Even though it's sometimes difficult to acknowledge the error of our ways, we must try to at least be become, become, the, become the person that God has destined us to be. Solomon spoke back in chapter 12 when he said, the way of a fool seems right to him. So what is the answer? What can we do to make sure we are truly on the right path? We ask God. God will indeed tell us and direct us when we're truly right and when we are truly wrong. We may be able to fool ourselves, but we will never be able to fool God. You see, the issue of correction is really the main issue of this text. This was a problem back in Solomon's time, but I believe it's even more of a problem for us today. When is the last time you attempted to correct someone? This is a difficult task today because our society promotes the idea that everyone has the right to walk their own walk and to live their own lives their own way to everybody is living their truth the challenge with living your truth and i think we all should live our truth but our truth must come in alignment with, with the truth and when our truth is not in alignment with the truth then our truth is a lie i know that's strong how and, and, and we have breeding a society where no one can bring anyone else into the truth hardly. Parenting is different now. I grew up in an era, and I, I, I'm not knocking what parents do now. Don't, don't, that's not to get it twisted. But I look at it from this perspective. When I grew up, my parents were in charge of me. My parents guided and directed me. They led me in the things that were right, corrected me when I was wrong. Now we have parents who allow children to determine their truth without, uh, without necessarily bringing them along into the truth. And so we breeded a, a uh, uh, so we're breeding a, a, a generation of, of people who are 
who have become gods to themselves, making decisions for themselves without uh, any reference to the truth. It's a challenge. Today, everything goes is the mentality that is prevalent in our society. Why would you need to correct anything if everything is right? If we're not careful, we will raise up, and it's happening, an entire generation of people who will always set themselves as right, innocent, and righteousness, not realizing it is indeed becoming the stronghold of self-righteousness. How do we address this today? What does this mean to us today? It means that God looks at your heart. He sees your inner motives. He looks past your facade and even past your limited understanding. If you truly want to be right, then seek to be right with God. Ask him to expose to you your inner faults and flaws. When God does, ask him to help you to make the correction you need to make in order to become the person he desires you to be. There is an overwhelming peace that overtakes you when you know that you are right with God. We must learn to seek the peace of God today. Verse number two, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Ties right into verse number one. People are prone to rationalize sin, to self-justify, and to fail to see the reality of their sin before God. There is a way that seems right to man, but because it is sinful, it will lead to death. The deceptive heart that man is born with needs to be reborn in Christ. God sees the true state of all our hearts and only those which are cleansed with the blood of Jesus will be clean and pure. It's what brings us into right standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number three. To do justice, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Anybody can perform rituals and ceremonies, be religious and follow tradition. But again, God is interested in the state of the heart. He wants those who obey him by faith and who lead lives devoted to righteousness and justice. If the religion, false traditions never saved anybody, but those who obey the commands of God demonstrate that they have hearts that have been reborn in Christ. Saul disobeyed God by taking lambs as a part of the spoil from the battle. He tried to satisfy God by sacrificing them, but God wanted obedience rather than sacrifice and to listen to him more than burnt offerings. We got to do right. It is what he desires us to do. More than the sacrifice, he wants us to be positioned in righteousness. First Samuel 15 and 22 says, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Obedience to God's commands is how we prove our love for him, not by vain rituals devoid of submission to God in the heart. John 14 and 15. If you love me, hallelujah, 
keep my commandments. The message Bible paraphrases this verse uh, is very, para, um, para, paraphrase of this verse is very powerful. It reads, clean living before God. And this is the paraphrase of, of Proverbs 21, verse 3. Clean living before God and justice with our neighbor means far more to God than religious performance. The father is not interested in ritualistic practices. If your heart's not right before him, our Lord is looking to be your Lord. A personal Lord who is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. That's his desire. He wants to be Lord of all, not halfway, but he wants to be Lord of all. And not just with outward performances, but with pure hands and a clean heart. Here are a few things I want you to consider. Number one, sacrifice or offerings are not bribes to make God overlook our character flaws. Number two, we can't buy God's favor or attempt to exchange good behavior in one area for bad behavior in another. And number three, partial obedience is disobedience. Allow God to perfect you. Live from a heart that's pure and open before God. It's a better way to do things. And that is to follow the way of the Lord. Verse number four, a hearty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. The wicked person is driven by a deceitful and wicked heart. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That kind of heart is filled with pride and arrogance. It has no reverence for God. That kind of heart looks down on others and, uh, and selfishness begins to take reign in them. That sinful nature will lead to all other kinds of sin. Only Jesus can change that kind of heart and bring newness of life. Verse number five. The plans of the diligent. Wow, this is a good lesson tonight. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. But those of everyone who's hasty, surely to poverty. Listen, planning, strategizing, and seeking godly counsel are all wise things to do. I want to say that again. Planting, strategizing, and seeking godly counsel are all wise things to do. Those who make haste, careless decisions without any uh, forethought often will find that their decisions don't end well. Solomon was running a kingdom with a billion dollar surplus at the time of this writing. The blessing of the father was operating in his life and on the nation. No one could say that Israel was not experiencing supernatural favor. Other nations knew that Israel was blessed because of the overwhelming success the nation and its citizens experienced. So the question is this, did they have anything to do with it? Was Solomon's kingdom blessed because of God's goodness alone, or did God work with them? Was it because they were honoring him and following his principles? Let's look at it from this perspective. Do you and I have a role in our success? Does our actions have anything to do with our prosperity, whether it's prospering physically, spiritually, socially, or financially. If you read Chronicles and Kings, you will see the success of the nation go up 
and down. And it was always based upon the decisions of the leader and its citizens. When the leader and the people honored God and did what he said the nation to do, the nation was blessed. When they did not honor God and did not follow his plan and strategies, they were not. Was God still God? Absolutely. God was God the entire time. But their success was largely contingent upon their willingness to cooperate with God. They had to cooperate with the God they claimed they served. You and I must cooperate with God, follow his plans and his strategies. God will guide us and give us plans and strategies for our success. How does we get that, Bishop? How do we receive that? Well, here are a few things. Number one, receive, pray, seek God. Then receive and lay out your plan and your vision. Write the vision and make it plain that those who read it may, may be able to run. Though the vision tarry, wait for it, it shall not lie. If the plan, if the dream, if the vision is from God and God will give the strategies to follow, if it is from God, it is indeed going to be big. Too big for you to accomplish without him. Listen, God cares about everything in your life and he will give you a plan and a strategy to accomplish what he's given you. Yes, I said about right at the beginning of this pandemic that God is up to something big. Last Sunday we were in service and I heard that word again and it rang out me and it came in a little different been. And I heard the spirit say to me, bigness is happening to the people of God now. So we pray and seek God, get his strategies, hear him and move. Number two, do be clear about your plan, then work your plan. Be clear about your plan, then work your plan. Do your part in your destiny. God has gifted you but it's up to you to put those gifts into motion. Listen, don't you dare stop thinking and dreaming, planning, strategizing. And as God gives it to you, then allow it to work. He's going to guide you. Receive, number one, two, do. And number three, become. Become what you believe you must be determined to become. What you believe you must be determined, be determined to become. Listen, I'm your cheerleader. I'm come to tell you, you can do it. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare surrender. Don't you dare sell in. I know that God is for you. And if God is for you, he's more than the whole world against you. So I'm looking for you to hang in there and watch God do great and mighty things for you. Let's go on to verse number six. Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. It is not worth it to pursue money, wealth, and worldly treasures by cheating, stealing, and being crafty to get it from others. Much of the way people gain wealth in the world today, surprisingly, is not honest, but it's oppressive. It comes by exploitation, deception, favoritism, and sometimes even blackmail. This lifestyle is a evidence of a person who is on a fast track downward because they love themselves and money more than they love the welfare of their souls. Solomon warns us from falling into, falling into this trap of thinking that a quick buck earns dishonestly. And that's the answer. The dishonest wealth may come, but just like it, it can surely go away. 
because anything that will compromise your integrity and the integrity of God's word is going to be temporary and indeed be detrimental. The God's word translation of this verse reads like this. Those who gather wealth by lying and wasting time, they are looking at death. If you know better, then you ought to do better. Because if you consciously sow bad seed, the father who is the Lord of the harvest is not going to sit by and allow you to reap a good harvest. Bad seed produces a bad harvest every time. Every time. We must allow good seed to be planted if we want to reap a good harvest. What good is it to seek progress the wrong way? When you know that ill-gotten progress is actually regress. It doesn't set you forward. It pushes you back. Verse number seven. The violence of the wicked will destroy them because they refuse to do justice. Here Solomon once again drives home the importance of our decisions. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, our decisions and actions matter. The type of seed, here it is again, we sow, determines the type of harvest we'll reap. I hear people all the time talk about them wanting to know the word of God. Or say they know the word of God, but they choose to violate its commands, disrespecting and disregarding God in the process. And then when things go haywire in their lives, they come back and say, how could God allow this to happen? Or why did God do this to me? If we would be honest, we would stop blaming God. If we were truly be honest, we wouldn't even blame the devil. Not for everything. Sometimes we have simply made bad decisions. Those bad decisions has gotten us in trouble. Now we should thank God for his grace, his goodness, his mercy, and his loving kindness. And it is awesome when God intervenes and stops us from receiving what we deserve. That's a good place you should shout. But don't get upset if you actually wind up reaping a bad harvest after you've sowed some bad seed. If you and I continue to ignore God's word, if we continue to ignore his will and his way, we will reap what we sow. Solomon tells us that you will wind up destroying yourself. You won't have anyone to blame but yourself. If you know better, then you ought to do better. Somebody ought to put that in chat. If you know better, then you ought to do better. Deuteronomy 28 is a chapter that I know all too well because my spiritual father has taught it many, many times. It is the outline of the blessings that come from obeying God and the curses that come from disobeying God. Moses said today, I am giving you the law and I'm teaching, uh, 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 giving you the teachings of the Lord. Always obey them, he says, and the Lord will make Israel the most famous and important nation of the earth. He talks about how God was going to bless them in many ways. He was going to bless their business. He was going to bless their, their, their farms. He was going to bless their, uh, uh, their children. He was going to bless the harvest of their crops to be large. They would have plenty of food to eat. Uh, they would uh, be successful in their daily work and successful in everything that they do. Their storehouses would be full and everything on earth 
will know that they belong to the Lord and they would be afraid of them. They would have plenty of money and lend to other natures, but you won't need to borrow any for yourself. And that's just a little bit of the text. The picture of Moses painting up of living in the blessing is awesome. But then he goes on to say in Deuteronomy 28, and if you don't obey them, he will put many curses on you. Your businesses will fail. You won't have enough to eat. You won't have enough money. Your children will be affected. Everything you have will be affected. This is why you and I have to come back to the word of the Lord and follow God's plan for our lives. Verse number eight, the way of a guilty man is perverse, but as for the pure, his work is right. Here, Solomon contrasts the crooked ways of the sinner with the pure ways of the believer. The point that he's making is that there should be a difference between the two. He, many, many, many. The word crooked in the text means twisted or wicked. People without God can live wicked or twisted lives without even recognizing it. The enemy can blind the eyes of the wicked to the point where they truly believe that wrong is right and right is wrong. That's important for us to remember. We must know that using the words like right and wrong, and these words are almost taboo in today's society. People don't want to talk about right and wrong. They want to talk about what makes them feel good and what, uh, if, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, doesn't, don't do it. They don't deal with right and wrong. You have to remember that the enemy is a master deceiver of people, and he deceives people into believing that they're on the right path when they're clearly on the wrong path. Very important for us to understand that. People think they're right. They come up with all of this stuff that sounds good. But when you test it, when it's tried against the word of God, it doesn't stand. Many people live in sin and take pleasure in it. Now, there are many people who enjoy living in sin. They did their best to have a good time in it. You know, like they like they, they used to say, I was sinking deep in sin. We <laughs> they enjoyed it. But that same person who enjoyed it is a person who has not been redeemed and not in right standing with the Lord. Solomon's point is that if we can agree that sinners live twisted lives, then we must also agree that believers should not. There should be a clear difference between the sinner and the believer. I'm not talking about outward appearance. Because you could put on a chapel cap, don't wear no earrings, no makeup. Men wear long sleeve shirts. Put your hair up in a bun, let it grow long, don't straighten it, whatever. It's days of natural hair now, anyway. Say so you don't go here, you don't go there, you don't do this, and you don't do that. But the real reflection is what comes out of your life. How are you living from the inside out? Listen, there should be a clear difference. We've said this before throughout our study in Proverbs, a difference between the sinner and the saint. Our compass, our guide for living should not be calibrated toward unrighteousness. Our perspective should not be perverted. Our desires should be pure. 
our hunger and thirst should be towards righteousness and our conduct and our character should be representative of the God who we claim we serve. It's the same God who lives in us and we live in him. Amen, amen. I'm going to do verse number, uh, I'm going to actually stop right here and we're gonna pick up at verse number nine next week because I know the nine is gonna take me a while to get through, amen. So I'm gonna stop with verse number nine and we're gonna pick it up next week. I pray that you have been blessed by the word. Listen, I wanna challenge all of you. Allow God through the wisdom that he gives to search and try your heart. Allow him to do that. I'm praying for you. Listen, every day we're bombarded with a whole lot of things, but the wisdom for the heart is the thing that God gives us that we can live from our hearts, from the inside out and experience living an extraordinary life by applying the wisdom of God every day. Listen, I bless God for each of you and thank God for what he's doing in your life. He's a great God worthy of all the praise, the glory and the honor. Please join us tomorrow at 6 a.m. for 6 a.m. prayer. I'm excited about the culture of prayer rising. My, 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 did we have a time in noonday prayer on yesterday. Remember, just to, for your remembrance, we are praying every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 6 a.m. We're praying every Tuesday at 12 noon. I'm blessing God for the powerful testimonies that are coming in. Testimonies of healing and deliverance and doors being opened people going in for tests and they can't find anything. People going in for tests and the tests coming back all as well. It's the kind of God we serve. We're gonna to continue to pray and let the culture of prayer rise. I want to say again, a special thank you to the Kingdom Life Cathedral Ministry family for your serving in ministry during the Kingdom Life Global Fellowship Conference. My, 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 what a time we had. What a life-changing experience we had. Listen, I'm still receiving calls and texts about the impact the conference made on so many lives. Many people's lives and ministries will never be the same. And I bless God for your presence and your willingness to serve. Now, listen. I wanna encourage all of you to join me on this coming Sunday. I'm telling you, worship and word have been explosive. You don't wanna miss it. This coming Sunday at 9 a.m., we invite you to join us either on Facebook Live or, or in person. Listen, let me tell you, it's so I get so excited. And I bless God for Facebook, but I'm telling you, I, I'm a little partial to seeing you in person. I get so excited when I see you come in the door and bless God, I'm seeing more and more of you. And I bless God for how he's keeping us and bringing us back together again. I truly thank God for you. We love you and we're praying for you and your families. Listen, I'm gonna make a special announcement. You don't wanna miss Sunday. Write it down, November 28th. Sunday, November 28th at 3.30 p.m. is the service of cons consecration and installation. It is the service of consecration and installation. Amen. Of those in our ministry, amen. My spiritual father will be there with us, sharing again with us in the word. Apostle Wilbert Baltimore, I'm so excited. You don't want to miss it. Um, you want to prepare yourselves now to be present. We're expecting, amen, people from far and near to come and share with us in worship. We're preparing now. Everybody will be kept safe. We'll be indeed doing all we can to keep everyone safe and follow the CDC guidelines. You don't want to miss it. 3.30 p.m. is the service of consecration and installation. Listen, I'm so grateful for your faithfulness to serve and, the, and, and, and by the way of giving. 
we are blessed. We could not do without uh, what we do without your faithful um, uh, commitment to sow and to give. You can give several ways. You can give online, um, kingdomlifecathedral.org slash give. It will lead you right to our giving app and you'll be able to give. You also can send your, your, your gifts of love in to Kingdom Life Cathedral Ministries, P.O. Box 967, Ranson, West Virginia, 25438. That is again, KLCM, P.O. Box 967, Ranson, West Virginia, 25438. Listen, I bless God for you. We love you. We're praying for you. And I want to encourage you to stay kingdom strong. We do it together. We're kingdom strong together. Remember, it's your moment in time. Live the kingdom life. Blessings and love. Until the next time.